I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 20, the last section of that chapter, and we're going to be considering the theme, Following Jesus. It's interesting that in the life of Jesus Christ, there is a literal following, a walking with Jesus that happens for the disciples, as in that group of 12, as well as the extended group of disciples. And that physical illustration of following Jesus down the roadway, as we're going to see from Jericho to Jerusalem, is a metaphor for our lives following Jesus spiritually, of having our eyes set upon him, of setting our spiritual feet on the pathway of following Jesus. You know, a number of years ago, there was a movement spawned which went by the initials WWJD. What would Jesus do? The unfortunate thing about that movement it was, is that it really was illegitimate. It featured individuals doing what Jesus would not do and trumpeting that they were doing what Jesus would do. Preaching messages Jesus did not preach and would not endorse, and yet this is what Jesus would do. So just because you have a clever saying that seems to line up with following Jesus does not mean that you really are following him. I think many people are following a Pied Piper to hell. Instead of following Jesus, we're reminded that Satan can transform himself to appear as an angel of light. Do you think he would stop short of presenting himself as Jesus to individuals? No, he would not. And this is one of those alert flags that I raise when I hear of people having visions or dreams of Jesus. I'm always concerned which Jesus they're following because Jesus plainly said there will be many people who come who present themselves as the Messiah, the Christ. And he says, don't follow them unless they come from heaven with a trumpet sound, with the shout of the archangel to rapture the saints, and then come back on the white horses to conquer those who will not bow their knee willingly. You see, the Jesus we're to follow is one who is clearly identified and described in Scripture. And so it behooves us to look into Scripture and see what Scripture says and not necessarily follow what the masses think. So Jesus is beginning this journey, as I mentioned earlier, from, he had begun from Galilee, and now he's down at Jericho, just on the western side of the city of Jericho. Help me out with the clicker. I'm having problems with it. There we go. Thank you. Do we not? Okay. We don't have anything else. Very good. And uh, <laughs> just didn't know what of my uh, intro I might have put in there. We'll get to the reading of this verse in just a moment, but he's on the final leg of that journey. You see, it's come all the way down, crossed over the Jordan, and on that transverse side of the Jordan, traveled for a while, and then he's come back across just near the, the uh, city of Jericho, and then he's going to proceed from there on to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem is where he will give his life as a ransom for many. So these are important days in the life of Jesus Christ. And what we find here in verse 29 is that as they, Jesus and his disciples, went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And it's interesting to me that this has happened a number of times in our study of the book of Matthew, that the word crowd, which already is a collective singular representing an unnumbered group, but a large group, is accompanied by the adjective great, a great crowd. So we're left wondering how many thousands or tens of thousands of people this may have been. And we have no idea because God's word does not seek to identify it, though God could have told you to the last person how many were there. But what I want us to understand is that a great crowd followed him. And we emphasize that word great so that it really strikes us. Because you and I have this unique ability to take what is truly great and dumb it down to the point that it is no longer great. Our society has that ability as well. 
But we want to keep it before our minds that this, there are a lot of people, and that group is not a homogenous group. It's a mixture of many different kinds of people. In fact, many of them may have been Passover pilgrims heading up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They are within one week of the final Passover of Christ's life on earth when he will actually give his life for us as our Passover lamb. And it was the fact in Israel that when they were a nation, in the years that they were there in their promised land, everyone who could possibly make the trip at Passover was expected to do so. So this could be a huge group of people. We, again, have no idea. The crowds would have been enormous. Jerusalem itself would have been absolutely crammed with people. The temple complex overflowing This is the kind of scene that we're supposed to imagine, and this leads into the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. This same group is coming with Christ on this journey. So many of them, maybe all of them, were Passover pilgrims. But many of these people were curiosity seekers. This happened throughout the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus was well known in Israel by this time. He's over three years of public ministry, three and a half years perhaps. And wherever Jesus went, it seems that he drew a crowd. He drew a crowd because he had a lot of miracles, first of all, that frankly excited interest. People brought their sick people from all over the place. We read of regions where every sick person in the area was brought to Jesus. And scripture says, and he healed them all putting doctors and hospitals out of work, I guess. I mean, we're talking about complete healing. Blind people are no longer blind. Sick people don't have a medicine prescribed to them. They're completely healed. So the miracles drew in a lot of people that wanted Jesus to heal them. We don't read in this text of Jesus healing anyone. It's still possible that he did. We're not told everything. John tells us that in the last chapter of his gospel, that if everything were written, he says, I suppose the world itself, a little bit of hyperbole to be sure, could not contain the books that could be written. And then if you added all of the sermons that have been preached and all of the uh, other books that have been written about these events, you know, you could get quite a bit. You could fill many, many libraries. But it's also the fact that Jesus' teaching was compelling, that people came to hear what he had to say because he made a lot of sense out of Scripture. And you remember that we're told in the, in the Gospels that one of the prevailing opinions was Jesus speaks as one who has authority and not like the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees tried to derive authority from individuals who were well-respected. And so what they would do, preachers still do it today, they would quote Dr. So-and-so. Okay, it was called rabbi then. And they would quote another rabbi over here, and they would build their case based on how many rabbis agreed with them and ignore the ones who disagreed. Jesus didn't do that. You'll notice that when he talks about what others have said, it's usually in the way of corrective teaching. You have heard that it was said, and he's not necessarily quoting Scripture there in the Sermon on the Mount. He's quoting the rabbinic teachings related to that Scripture which may in fact have completely twisted like the one you've heard it said, you shall love your, enemy, you shall love your uh, uh, friends basically and hate your enemies. And Jesus says, that's not God's word. God never said that. And so it was that his teaching compelled people because of its authority and because the spirit of God was in agreement with what he's saying and so conviction is falling as well. But in these curiosity seekers are many people who hope that he would liberate Israel from Rome. Never forget that 
thought in the back of people's minds as they listen to Jesus. And he's talking about, remember one of the main themes of the book of the Gospel of Matthew? is the kingdom of heaven. In other Gospels, it's called the kingdom of God. It's the same thing. And this kingdom idea made people think, okay, that means he's getting rid of Caesar and Rome, and he's setting up his own government. I can't wait. Imagine how you would feel if some foreign entity came and took over our country and their laws became our laws and we had no say in the matter. We can't, we can't really put ourselves in that position, probably, because we haven't been under in that situation. We can't imagine it. But these people lived it. But in this crowd as well, I want us to note, some were really true believers. You have the disciples of Jesus Christ, 11 of the 12 anyway. You have women that we identified in a previous message and a number of other people as well. What we mean by this as believers, it's individuals who truly trusted Christ to be their Savior from sin. Now, that seems odd because he hasn't yet died. And yet he has said numerous times, the Son of Man will give his life for the sins of the world. He will rescue his people. In fact, his very name means Jehovah saves. So every time his name was called out, people knew what that meant. You and I have to have it defined for us because we don't speak Greek. And we don't speak Hebrew. And so these names don't mean anything to us until someone tells us what they mean. But every time someone called him Yeshua, they knew they were saying, Yahweh saves. And they saw in him one who could truly be the Savior. And they confessed like Peter, you are the Christ. And they placed their faith in him. In other words, we're saying these individuals were repentant. Remember, that's a keynote of the ministry of Jesus Christ as well. His message Pursuant to John the Baptist's message early in the book of Matthew, as John is taken off the scene first in arrest and then in martyrdom, Jesus preaches the same message. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has come to you. Repent. That was a constant theme that Jesus preached. And when people truly did that in faith in him, they are now classified as believers. In other words, we're saying that these individuals knew that Jesus is the Son of God. And that title, Son of God, I don't think has the same impact on us as it did on the Jewish people. We're so used to saying that we're sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ, John 1.12, that we forget that when the Son of God was on this earth and he said, I, the Son of Man, am also the Son of God, he was saying he was God the Son. And you can follow that through John chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, as on many occasions people try to stone him or kill him in some other form because he, as a man, made himself to be God. That is literally what they say to him when he says, for which of my good works do you stone me? You see, the Son of God was an impactful title that meant he was literally God the Son. We're saying then that these individuals followed Jesus not because it was convenient, because there was curiosity, because there was teaching, but because of true devotion, true dedication of their lives to Christ and his message because they knew that Christ was directing them to the Father and was giving them eternal life. As he had said many times, I give to my own eternal life and they will never perish. But in spite of this, most of the people that were following Jesus Christ were unbelievers. They were individuals that had not yet trusted Christ in the ways that we've just described. Many of these individuals thought that being a Jew was enough to get them to heaven, into God's kingdom. We're already God's chosen people. We don't need to do anything. It's a neat deal. 
The contract was signed by Abraham a long time ago, and we're in that contract, and so we've got nothing to worry about. There were others in the crowd thinking that their good works were going to take them to heaven, and the first of their good works was Jewish birth, for which they were not even responsible. And then they thought, well, circumcision, hey, I'm circumcised the eighth day, and just exactly what Scripture had said. I offer the sacrifices that Scripture said. I, I observe separatist rites. I wear certain clothing, don't wear other clothing. I eat certain food, don't eat other food. I give alms. I do all sorts of things. Obviously, I'm going to heaven. And Jesus kept telling them, not so fast. Slow down. Think about these things. As he said to Nicodemus, that teacher of the Jews, you must be born again. And just because Jesus uses that language in John chapter 3 and doesn't really use it outside of that, that I can recall in the rest of the gospel record, do you think that that means he'd never said that again? No, I think it was something that he said repeatedly. And I think people were brought up against that, and we see some indications of it at certain passages of Scripture that get close to that statement, even though they don't exactly say the same thing. Where Jesus tells them, you are of your father, the devil. If God were your father, then you wouldn't try to kill me. But you're doing the works of your father. Why? Because you've not been born again. He doesn't, again, use that phrase there. But that's the idea. There's, there's a difference. You're the child of the wrong person. You're the child of the devil. How can you then be made the child of God? You have to be reborn. It's a transformation. It's something you must beg God to do for you, and it's something you cannot do for yourself, just as you could not birth yourself into this world. You see, these individuals, in contrast to the true disciples, are following Jesus casually. When it's convenient, especially if he's going to feed people or heal people, and I'm hungry or sick, or in, have some other need, when Jesus is perceived as someone who can help me along the path of life and make me happy. Does that sound like anybody you know of today? There are a lot of people talking about Jesus because Jesus makes me happy. Jesus has made me successful. Jesus has done this, and they may not even know him. You see, they're rejoicing in the blessings that Scripture says are like the rain that falls from heaven that falls on the just and the unjust. And some of life's blessings fall that same way. They'll never mistake blessings for salvation. If you don't come in through the narrow gate and the, and the small door, you don't get in. If you don't come in through the spiritual rebirth, you're not in. It doesn't matter what else has happened in your life. Unless you are a true believer, you're not a believer. But there are others that weren't exactly actively following Jesus, and in verse 30 were introduced to two of them. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, listen to the words in these guys' mouths. They're not following Jesus because of this problem of blindness. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. This is an amazing statement coming from these men. We'll call these the others who are calling out to the crowd, calling out to the one who's leading the crowd. They are both blind men who are sitting beside the road. Now, the road in question is the main road from Jericho to Jerusalem. This is the road that many of the pilgrims will follow, especially those who have come from Galilee and have done the same route that Jesus and his disciples and most faithful Jews did. You come down partway on the western side of the uh, Jordan River, and then you cross over to the east bank and come down on the Transjordan, 
the side of the river that is actually Jordan today. And you come down to nearly the Dead Sea. And just north of the Dead Sea, you recross the Jordan River to the West Bank. And there you find Jericho right before you, just as the children of Israel did when they crossed all those years before. And after spending a little time in Jericho, refreshing yourself perhaps, you get on the main thoroughfare, the Jericho-Jerusalem road, you know, whatever. This is the road. Why are the blind men there? Well, they're obviously there because they're begging. Because that's the only hope that a blind individual or a lame individual or someone otherwise incapacitated could have any money. There was no Social Security. There was no Medicaid. There was no CHIP program. That's a Pennsylvania thing. There were none of these other programs available. You were on your own. And this was a really good time of year to be a beggar. Because people are going up to Jerusalem for Pentecost, for Pas- Passover. Pentecost will come later. They're going up for Passover, and they're in a religious frame of mind, and they would tend to give more. But these individuals are not going up to Jerusalem. They're on the lowest rung of society that you can imagine. They're lower than low. They've got no way to go anywhere, do anything, unless someone leads them. And in fact, as far as the rest of the people, and in fact, we see this in the crowd, then their response to these individuals in the next verse, these individuals are despised and ignored by many individuals because they're on this very, very low rung of society. And the only way I'm going to have anything to do with them is when I really feel like I'm obligated to give them something in order to get in good with God for something I want. Don't think people are any less crass in their talking about spiritual things than they are today back in that time. Humans are humans. What is it that Ecclesiastes said? There is nothing new under the sun. What has been shall be, and what will be has been. People think today like people thought back then, and don't be surprised for it. But these Passover pilgrims then are almost required to give alms because, again, they're going up to worship God, and if they are stingy with this guy by the road, then God's not going to pay attention to my prayer when I stand up in the temple and I beat my and I and I raise my hands in the air, not being on the chest. That's the repentant guy. You raise your hands in the air and say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that beggar I just gave alms to. But did you notice I gave him something? It wasn't much, but you know, I gave him what I could. And remember that. Point for me. Passover pilgrims. This was, this was the harvest time for the beggars. But these beggars are not interested in alms. They're not saying, alms for the poor, alms for the blind, give to me. Instead, they're crying out to Jesus. Now, Mark and Luke both record this miracle in slightly different descriptions. Mark and Luke only tell us about one individual. Mark tells us his name is Bartimaeus. He's probably the more vocal of the two. But Matthew brings in both of them. Matthew does this several times when he brings in people that other gospel writers don't mention as being part of a group that comes to Jesus. Don't be surprised by that. Remember who was there. Matthew was there. Mark and Luke were not. So they're going on other people's remembrance of it, and it's not that they're inaccurate, it's just that they're emphasizing certain points. You know, you imagine it's it's generally thought that Mark's information comes through Peter. And so Mark is digging through uh, Peter's recollections, and Peter says, yeah, there was this guy, I remember the one guy's name is Bartimaeus. I can't remember the other guy's name right now. Anybody like that here? (laughs) Or, I met two guys today, I forget their names. They told me three times each, can't remember. Not that God couldn't have brought the names back, but Matthew's the only one that tells us there were two men. But Mark also tells us that they were 
hearing, these blind men were hearing that Jesus of Nazareth was passing this way. That's an important qualification because Matthew is assuming that we will know that this is the Jesus who is from Nazareth and all the other descriptors we could put there. Mark doesn't make that assumption because he's writing to Gentiles. So is Luke. That's going to be their primary audience. And as they write, they want this audience to understand this isn't another Jesus that may run around your town. I've known several people with the name Jesus, either as a first or a middle name. It's very popular in the Latin culture to do that. But these, right, the writer here in Mark, he wants us to know this is Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew assumes we know that because we're following his story all the way through from the beginning of the gospel. Notice particularly what they're asking for Jesus to do. They're asking for mercy be, to be applied to them. Mercy is a quality of pity given to those who are in great need. They recognize themselves as being in great need and they're calling out for the pity, the compassion of Jesus Christ. That's another word that is frequently associated with mercy. But notice how they address the one whom they are asking for this mercy. They address him as Lord, kurios in Greek. But if you look at the Greek translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek, known as the Septuagint or the Septuagint, and that translation frequently uses kurios, this Greek word we see here to translate two names for God, Adonai and Yahweh, interchangeably, Lord translates or Kurios translates Adonai and Yahweh, names that are particular names of God. So when these men are calling out to Jesus like this, they're not merely saying, sir, which can be the least exalted use of the word kurios in the Greek culture. These individuals are coming from a different background. They're Jews. They understand the link between the Old Testament names of God. They're calling him God. They also refer to him as the son of David. Now, son of David is not just simply saying he was of the tribe of Judah or that he was born in Bethlehem. This is a messianic title. They are, by this title, saying that he is, in their belief, the Messiah that God would send to Israel, the one he had promised down through the centuries. They're declaring their faith in Jesus as that Messiah. Isn't it interesting? There are only a few people in the gospel record who make this link and say it on record. There's Peter, and then the other disciples chime in. And the others are people like these blind men and certain Gentiles that came to Jesus for healing. Let's put this in a point that's kind of poignant, helpful. These blind men saw Jesus more clearly than their sighted neighbors. The curiosity seekers in the crowd, the unbelievers in the crowd, including Pharisees and Sadducees and so on and so forth. These were common people who knew themselves to be in need of the mercy of God and saw God in Jesus. That's what was supposed to be seen. That's what John reveals in John 1 verse 14 when he says that this word that he's been talking about became flesh and he said, we beheld his glory, the glory like the only begotten of the Father. This was God in human flesh. And the blind man saw, the blind man saw it with spiritual eyes, not with physical eyes. But notice the reaction of the crowd in verse 31. The crowd rebuked them, censured them, basically told them to shut up. Telling them, be silent. But they cried out the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The more they're rebuked, the louder they get. 
Because they're convinced that Jesus and only Jesus can help them. I wish that would be our testimony as well, that the more pressure is applied to us to not witness, the louder our witness becomes, the more faithful it becomes, the more insistent it becomes. Because do you realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ, as described in Scripture, that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, became man, that He lived a perfect life, that He gave His life as a ransom for sinners, that he not only died, but was buried and rose the third day, and now has ascended to the Father where he intercedes as the soul in and unique ex, uh, intercessor for our souls. And that by faith in him and repentance from our sin, we can have eternal life. There's the gospel in a nutshell. You take any element out, add any element in, especially any element of works, and you've lost everything. As Galatians 1, 8, and 9 says, it's not another gospel of the same kind. It's another gospel of a different kind that doesn't even deserve the word gospel attached to it. And yet the prosperity gospel is preached. The signs and wonders gospel is preached. The kingdom gospel, which is not the kingdom that we're teaching, but rather an aberration is preached. The revolutionary gospel that Jesus was a revolutionary. And you can put in your terrorist du jour, and that's supposed to be a Jesus-like person. No, no, no. No, no, no. You don't get to recast Jesus in your mold. You accept him as he is revealed in Scripture, or you have a false Jesus who will not lead you to heaven, but can only lead you to hell. And Satan rejoices every time people follow the false Jesus because he has a multitude of them out there to fool anyone and everyone who is unsuspecting or willing just to grab onto something without looking into it. So these men are rebuked by the crowd. The crowd tries to hush them, to reprimand them as if they were unruly children. That's what this word kind of means. But you see, these men knew who Jesus was. And they're not going to be quieted by this. But you think, why did the crowd get upset? Who cares? They're calling, they're yelling, they're making a commotion. What, what's the big deal? We're just, you're just walking down a road. Well, maybe Jesus was saying something, and these men were making it hard to hear. Have you ever been like that? Now, I hate to use this illustration. Have you ever had a child in your house? And that child was making noise when the news was on. Some, some important thing was occupying your mind, and you tell the child, shut up, be quiet, whatever. Don't you know you never talk when I'm doing whatever it is you're doing? And that's kind of the attitude that this crowd has. Perhaps the crowd's just anxious to get to Jerusalem. They think these men present an impediment. There's 15 miles from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem, and it's all uphill. Jericho is at the northern end of the Dead Sea. Now, you may realize the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. That is the surface of it. And then it goes still lower, at over 900 feet below sea level. Jericho is only 846 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is at 2,625 feet above sea level above sea level, so it's roughly 3,500 feet of elevation you're gaining as you're walking. So do you understand why people talked about going up to Jerusalem? Especially if you came through Jericho, that's the only way you could get there. You got to go up. Well, that made the trip even more tiring. So maybe they're thinking, hey, we got places to go, we got people to see, and maybe they're just simply thinking, who are these beggars to be calling out to Jesus? You see, many people may have thought this, beggars should not bother important people, and Jesus is important people. But Jesus has shown time and time again that he does not place himself above the needs of people, and these beggars perhaps know that, and so it is that they shout even louder. The translation, if you want to get real literal, could be something like this. They yelled out greatly. 
might think it sounds a little odd, but you know, it gets the idea across. They're yelling out and they just keep getting louder and louder because why? They believe Jesus could really heal them. If Jesus pays attention to us and if Jesus chooses to do so, he can make us see. You wonder, why hadn't they been healed before now? These are obviously adult men from the presentation that's given here. They're not children. They didn't just go blind. Why is it they haven't been healed yet? Remember, Jesus didn't do many miracles in the region called Judea. That is, Jerusalem and its environs, and Jericho would have been brought into that. Because of the rampant unbelief of the religious class and the persecution they raised, Jesus didn't do many miracles there. And so it's totally believable that you come to the end of Christ's earthly ministry and here are some blind men that have not yet been healed. But no one could discourage them. They were going to keep on yelling until Jesus either was out of earshot or he paid attention to their yell. So verses 32 and 33 inform us, and stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Very simple approach. Jesus stops and calls out to them. He responds to their call. This is despite the momentum of the crowd. If you've ever been in a huge crowd going somewhere, don't try to stop in the middle of it. It's just really not a good idea. And yet Jesus has the command to be able to stop and stop the momentum of the crowd. Imagine a few people bumped into each other. And a few people were wondering what's going on. Jesus stops despite the impatience of the crowd around him. He's not going to let that control what he wants to do. And then he does something that you might find a little bit curious if you have the right picture of who Jesus is. He asks them what they wanted. Do you mean he didn't know? Yes, he knew. Jesus frequently does this. And you can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and yes, I believe it was Jesus in his pre-incarnate state who was talking to Adam when he says, Adam, where are you? Knowing full well where Adam was and Eve, and yet he wanted them to admit it. Here, the same sort of thing is going on. He wants to call out their faith in him because by their saying, we want you to open our eyes, they're saying, we believe you can open our eyes. And it's something they wouldn't have said to anyone else in the crowd. Because no one else in the crowd could do it. They'd probably been to doctors and even their own rabbis had tried to get healing and that hadn't happened. So they asked for their eyes to be opened. It's interesting that in the miracles of Christ, ears and eyes are said to be opened it's not that there is some physical closure or something like this. This is just an expression that when open, they function properly. When closed, they're not functioning. Just like when we stop our ears and say, I can't hear you. I can't. <laughs> Annoying as that may be for the child to do that in front of us. We know they can hear us. You close your eyes. Look at this. You close your eyes. You know, We understand the symbolism at the very least that is going on here. But that's what they want. We want our eyes to be open. We want them to work properly. And Scripture very simply says that Jesus healed them. But it does give us a little bit more description to that. Notice, and Jesus in pity touched their eyes. And immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. So Jesus' healing of them involved that element of pity that we've talked about before. Now the word for pity, I won't pronounce it because I'll mispronounce it. It's a difficult Greek word to say, literally talks about the moving of your innards, your bowels, your guts. It was the Greek idea that you love someone, if you wanted to profess your love to them, you love them with all your guts. We would say heart. Think of it the same way. It is the heart of Jesus who goes out to these individuals. He is deeply moved by them, I think we can clearly say. Now, what is it about those men that moved Jesus in this way? Was it their need? No, Jesus has seen many blind people. He's been 
exposed to blind people that wanted to be healed, and Scripture doesn't necessarily say in each of the passages that he was moved by them. I think what really moved him was their faith. He had already heard of it, and now Scripture says he touched their eyes. And you think, well, okay, he touched their eyes, big deal. The interesting thing is that here in verse 34, where Jesus had pity on them and touched their eyes, it's a different word than that used in the previous verse by the blind men that said, we want you to open our eyes. The word the blind men choose is the word from which we get ophthalmology. It is the normal word for eyes. But Jesus uses a different word, or the word is used here to describe him touching their eyes. It's a word that is more frequently uh, translated vision or sight. So he went beyond the physical eyes as he touches their eyes. He touches their vision. He touches whatever it is that was defective that was keeping them from being able to see. And I think that there is here a depth of healing that is followed up by a depth of result in these individuals in a spiritual way. But at the first what we definitely know is he heals them completely and immediately. It's not a step-by-step healing. It's not a go to the pool of Siloam and wash and you will see, as Jesus had done on another occasion. It was instantaneous. He just touched. Maybe he said something, nothing's recorded. And their sight returned. And I would say that in this act, Jesus is illustrating something he has just taught in Matthew chapter 20, verse 27. What had he taught there? He said, whoever would be first among you must be your slave. He was saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, remember the quest for greatness that we studied not too long ago. If you want to be great, be a servant. So Jesus, the king of glory, touches beggars and he gave them sight. Remember, they're the lowest element of society. And in doing this, Jesus, I believe, is silently rebuking those that rebuked the blind men. They told them, hush, Jesus tells them, come. They tell them, here's a little pittance of money, be blessed. And Jesus says, here's your eyesight. Far different level of compassion. Far different level of concern. So Jesus is illustrating, I believe, what he has just taught his disciples and what he is in turn teaching us. But there's something mentioned at the end of verse 34 that I want to emphasize as well. Not only that they recovered their sight, Scripture says, and they followed him. So now the healed men, we can't call them blind men anymore. It's one of those things, when people are healed, you knew them as the blind man, and now you have to recast your identification. So we'll call them the healed men. The healed men follow Jesus. Notice, this is after all that's gone before. First of all, the what's nearest, they were completely healed. And so now they see and they're able to follow Jesus. Their sight has been restored, but it's a sight that's beyond just the physical. I believe spiritual vision is also granted them as well. You see, they're going to follow Jesus now, but I believe they're following him in a different way than most people. Do you remember when Jesus said, the one who is forgiven much loves much? It's kind of Still true today, isn't it? When we really understand the depth of the pit from which Jesus dug us to set our feet upon a rock and give us salvation, we just love Him more. And it's unfortunate that many who come to Christ early in life, who like I are trying to struggle to come up with a testimony that illustrates the great power of the deliverance that Jesus Christ brings. You know, I was tempted at one time to 
cast my story of conversion in this way. I was a thief. I was a blasphemer. I was a foul-mouthed individual. Then came my third birthday. Because I trusted Christ before my fourth birthday. Now, were all those things true of me before my third birthday? Yes. If you look at the description of Romans chapter 3, it was really true of me. It just hadn't been seen yet. And so the deliverance of a child in an early childhood decision is no less great than the deliverance of an individual who's gone into the depths of sin. It's just a matter of our perspective. Because the child, like the adult, needs God's forgiveness. Or there is no entrance into heaven. Well, here are these men following Jesus now. They've already proclaimed him to be Lord. Something that, in short order, the triumphal entry, people will be rebuked for doing. Don't call him Lord. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't stand that he would be given that form of respect and even near worship in many people's minds, actual worship. They had declared him to be the Son of God. They're saying he is the Messiah, the promised one. Everything that we're expecting will be fulfilled in some manner, shape, or form in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, these men had faith in Christ before they were healed. Imagine that faith now after they've been healed. And they cannot be from this point on casual followers, just curiosity seekers, just hangers on to see what happens next. These are individuals whose lives have been transformed. And they knew by whom. So in this record of these blind men being healed, remember that just like the crowd, not everyone who follows Jesus, who followed then or who says they follow now, do so for the right reasons. Scripture makes very clear that only those who come to Christ by faith are true followers. It was true then, it's true today. And so my exhortation to each of us is to be sure that we are true followers of Jesus Christ. Not that you know the language, that you can say the right words at the right time. It goes far deeper than that. Do you truly know who Jesus is? And has the Jesus of Scripture transformed your life by the new birth? If not, then you're not saved. And you need to be saved. If so, then you are saved and you need to testify of that. You need to be like those blind men crying out to the crowd. You've already had the mercy of Jesus Christ. Now you need to cry out to the crowd so that they would also come to Christ. We're going to take a moment and think about these things as we pray. Following the prayer, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but I just want you to understand I haven't forgotten that it's coming. But let's pray. Let's think about these things. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in preserving for us these records from the life of Jesus Christ that teach us many things about him, but also things about ourselves. Lord, we pray that you would help each of us to be sure we're following Jesus for the right reasons, that it is true faith that motivates any change in our lives, not that we're trying to earn our way to heaven, which can never be done, but that we are trying to show forth the virtues of Jesus Christ, who is now our Savior. Lord, we pray that you would use your word to bring conviction wherever that is necessary, to bring encouragement, that we would be stalwart witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, use us to glorify yourself. Use us to reach others, to bring them into your kingdom as well. We ask this for Jesus' sake.
Amen.